Recent studies put out just in the last couple of weeks have suggested that in some spaces, you know, green hydrogen could be cost competitive with, with blue hydrogen um, by 2030. So hello and welcome to the assay. Today we have Daniel Roberts, leader Hydrogen Energy Systems Future Science Platform at CSIRO, here to talk about hydrogen. So Daniel, thanks for being with us today. Hi, Amy, no problem, it's a pleasure. So decarbonization and the energy transition are one of the key themes in the mining and metals industry today. And hydrogen has been really gaining more attention recently as a broader part of this. So, what do you see as pushing the hydrogen industry today? And, you know, what is the discourse? Is it, does it, you know, what is it all about? It's interesting, isn't it? I get asked that a lot. And I think it's, it's, there's a few reasons for that. I mean, hydrogen has been around in an industrial context for 100 years. You know, it's been used in oil refining, um, ammonia production for fertilizers, et cetera. Um, and everyone's always sort of seen it as this opportunity to, to broaden into the energy space um, as it offers this potential for um, you know, carbon-free energy across a range of sectors. But I think technological readiness and, and costs have, have really prevented that from gaining much momentum. What we've seen shift in the last few years, maybe three or four years at the most, is um, some of those key technologies around electrolysis, around fuel cells, around mobility, you know, the tanks in the cars, for instance, um, they've all really got to the point where they're now quite mature. And we can see these, these cars now in places like California and, and Tokyo driving around the streets. Coupled with that is this real strong global um, pull for hydrogen. Um, we see countries like Japan and South Korea um, have hydrogen as a key component to their low emissions energy strategy, looking out to 2050 and beyond. Um, and we see Germany um, seeking to import low carbon hydrogen from Australia um, as part of their efforts to decarbonize. So I guess in the context of technologies becoming ready, um, large gov you know, governments around the world seeking to, um, to, to use that to, to decarbonize, supported by this shift in, in expectations, I think, of, of the way we make and use energy it really does um, paint a different picture for hydrogen um, in 2021 in, in, in the context of, of energy transition. And uh, looking at production and, you know, the differences between green, blue, other types of hydrogen, you know, what is the main difference in terms of emissions between these types? And um, what is, I guess, the relevance for the mining sector in terms of application? So hydrogen is seen as a real opportunity in, I guess, the energy transition because it does, um, when you use it, produce no CO2. Um, however, the way you make the hydrogen in the first place is really critical to whether or not it actually supports a, a decarbonisation strategy. So the hydrogen, which I mentioned, we've been using for 100 years or so, made it from coal or from natural gas, produces a lot of CO2. Um, and for that to be the source of hydrogen in this energy transition would not be very effective. So for those pathways, for the natural gas and the coal pathway to um, support decarbonised um, energy via hydrogen, that CO2 has to be captured. So um, hydrogen from, from gas or coal with CO2 capture is what people are calling blue hydrogen. Um, and that's getting a lot of interest from people because it's likely to be um, cost, com cost effective in, comp in comparison with what's currently used as an energy source quicker. However, green hydrogen, which is made from renewable energy, either via electrolysis or other means, the cost of that are coming down rapidly. And some recent studies put out just in the last couple of weeks have suggested that in some spaces, you know, green hydrogen could be cost competitive with, with blue hydrogen um, by 2030. And that's um, a really interesting demonstration of how fast things are changing in this space. Mm -hmm. And so um, you bring up kind of the cost um, competitiveness. And so looking at these economics, there are a lot of arguments that are stating that maybe the economics are not there in, um, necessarily in place to kind of justify 
say moving from EVs to hydrogen powered vehicles or um, kind of going with that, that, that shift. So mm. how do you make hydrogen more economic and where do you think we're likely to see the most uptake in hydrogen use given these sorts of economics that we're seeing? Given where we are on the, on the experience curve with, with green hydrogen, you make it more economic by doing it. <laughs> and that's what we're seeing happen mm -hmm. all around the world now. Um, in Australia, for example, um, ARENA, which is our federal government renewable energy agency, has grant funded three projects, um, 10 megawatt scale electrolyzers to make green hydrogen for a range of different applications. Now, by doing it at scale, um, you know, we really will see continuing um, falling in, in, in the cost of making green hydrogen. But I think whether, you know, whether or not it's a cost effective thing to do is really dependent upon the application space in, in which we're, we're considering hydrogen. So, um, I mean, in your question, you mentioned EVs. I really don't think we need to couch this in terms of hydrogen versus electric vehicles. I think that's um, probably not particularly helpful. I think for um, commuting style travel for small vehicles, um, urban going to and from work each day type of applications, battery electric vehicles are likely to be the, the winner there for a long time. And, and that's a really good application space for, for a technology like that. As we get bigger and want to travel further with heavier loads, um, batteries become a little bit more, more challenging in terms of how much we have to actually cart around to store the electricity. Um, and so hydrogen has really been seen as um, important in some of the larger applications around things like trucks and, and, and trains and, and even shipping um, where batteries would, I think, struggle to perform. So for me, it's not either or. It's how do we make this all fit together and work effectively um, to decarbonise. Now, the cost thing is, is interesting in the context of transport, but if we look at the, the spectrum of application spaces here, um, at one end we have things like remote area power, um, which is relevant to the mining sector where they rely on, you know, in, in Australia at least, trucked in you know, mind-boggling amounts of, of trucked in diesel. That's very expensive. Um, and so it's much easier for hydrogen to compete now in those spaces. And we're seeing some projects emerge with that, where that already is. Um, whereas something like, um, you know, using natural gas in a, in a, in a, in a dedicated manufacturing capability um, where that particular process has access to quite cheap gas, that's a much harder story now for green hydrogen um, to compete with. Um, so it's likely to be an application space down the track. Okay. Interesting. And I guess moving forward, what are some of the main research and development priorities um, for the industry, hydrogen industry today? And I suppose, what are the next steps that you're, you're seeing for the future of the industry? I guess what we're seeing now is, I guess, two, two angles here. One angle is let's do things and do things as big as possible. Um, and that's really important for, um, you know, to, I guess, instill some confidence in some of the, um, the, the, the companies, I guess, that have to, make investments in these processes. And so by doing things at scale, we de-risk some of these supply chains um, and contribute, of course, to ongoing cost reduction. Um, I guess in parallel with that, we're seeing a lot of research and development now um, continuing to target that cost piece because, as you've said in one of your questions, everyone's worried about the cost and, and there's good reason for that. And so um, coming up with materials, technologies, pathways that lower the cost of renewable hydrogen production is really important. And there's a way, you know, there's a whole range of ways of doing that. Um, it ranges from, you know, directly splitting water um, with photocatalytic materials right through to removing the number of process steps and going from, from electricity to hydrogen to a storage medium such as ammonia and then cracking back to hydrogen again. If we can remove those process steps, increase the efficiency, the cost will come down as well. And so um, doing things at scale, driving cost reduction, um, and removing process steps to support efficiency are all really important. Um, but really everyone at the moment is just trying to find ways of doing it, which is really exciting. Sounds great. Well, definitely a lot to um, look out for as we move forward through this kind of decarbonization and energy transition. So thank, uh, Daniel, I'd like to thank you for being here with us today and uh, sharing your, your thoughts on hydrogen. Pleasure.